Hey, welcome to the Note Investor Podcast. I'm Dan Deppin, and today I'm joined by Bill McCafferty from People's Mortgage Relief. So, Bill, how's it going? Doing well, Dan. I'm looking forward to it. How are you out in Colorado? I'm doing well. Our weather's actually turned cooler all of a sudden, so not not too bad. Uh, we've, been, we've been getting a lot of uh, a lot of rainstorms. So, okay, um, and you're in PA, right? Yeah, in Pennsylvania, uh, Chester County, Pennsylvania. About mm-hmm. 20 miles west of Philadelphia. Okay, gotcha. That's, um, I lived in Pennsylvania when I was a kid. I think that's about like maybe two hours from where I was from. It was like 50 miles north of Harrisburg. Okay, uh, yeah. So uh, you know, I'm 49. I lived in Pennsylvania my whole life. Yeah. Uh, so very familiar of all areas of uh, PA. Cool. Do you, do you buy notes in PA? I do. Um I buy residential, uh, mostly seconds Uh uh, throughout the whole country. Um, You know, as time has gotten tougher with uh, regulations and uh, compliance, um, you know, there's definitely states that you stay out of now. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, as a asset manager for different note investors, um, depending on um, where that note investor is compliant, um, you know, I can go into particular states under. Yeah, their... I was going to ask, like, what, like, what are some states that you steer away from? Um, you know, I know over the years, Ohio's got a little tougher with regulations. Um, mm-hmm. State of Washington, state of Oregon. Um, you know, New Jersey has been. Uh, New York. Um, and like I said, if I'm managing them for clients and they're complying in that state, um, I can manage their assets under their umbrella um, uh-huh. in, any, in any particular state. Um, for my own portfolio, it's definitely a little different. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, as we go along here and we talk, um, you know, I buy a lot more reperforming seconds mm-hmm. um, over the last five years. Um you know, not that I've went away from the non-performers, um, but, you know, with regulations and compliance, um, it makes it a little easier with the re-performers uh, than buying the non-performers. Yeah. Are, are you seeing a lot of non-performing seconds these days? I've I've personally not come across a ton of them. <laughs> so um, a few of the uh, clients that I manage assets for, uh, they're still active buyers. Um, it seems like probably over the last five years, um, it's been a lot of uh, seconds uh, out of PNC. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, USMR, um, they're a company here in PA. Uh, they do have a relationship with PNC. Um, you know, they're kind of involved with uh, Rob Hyeth. Um, Rob is fixed notes. Uh, Rob yeah. Pretty- He's in the Philly area also, right? He is. Um, yeah. Rob's a good guy. Um, he has a couple different companies, uh, but he has a mastermind. Mm-hmm. And he is the platform um, to buy and sell the USMR notes. Uh-huh. So he's, he's not really a broker. He kind of works with them, and it's more of a platform. So if you're in his mastermind, you get access to that um, that portfolio when he releases stuff. Gotcha. Gotcha. Yeah. It's interesting for me because Pennsylvania is like one of my go-no states. Okay. Lately. I don't know if you ever bought land contracts, but I ended up with one of the Harbor (laughs) CFDs in Pennsylvania that, you know, I bought prior to them getting sued by the state. And so we eventually got it worked out, but it was a gigantic pain. No, it's not absolutely. And I know a lot of the uh, counties in Pennsylvania, hold a, uh, the sheriff charges you a fee um, at the foreclosure sale to handle it, which is another fee on top of all your foreclosure legal costs. Um, you know, and that mm-hmm. could range anywhere from 1500 to 2500 Yeah. So, you know, I know that kind of uh, has investors kind of veering away from it. Mm-hmm. As you know, costs add up. Um, especially legal costs and servicing costs um, as a note investor. Yeah, especially in some of those, you know, states that have longer timelines. 
for nah. Thanksgiving. It doesn't mean you can have to stay away, but you have to factor that in. Nah, and like you said, um, you know, you just mentioned it. You banged the, uh, you banged it on the head there. You know, you just got to be prepared when you're buying these non-performers. You got to know your costs. Um, you definitely need to be educated. Um, you know, to go to distance, even if you want to work something out with the homeowner, um, you absolutely need to know all your costs. Yeah, it always cracks me up when sellers want absurdly high prices for non-performers. That leaves no room for costs. And I'm like, are you just hoping somebody makes a mistake? Because, I mean, I'm sure they know better. Like, they know what it's going to cost to work it out. No, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, even on top of your foreclosure costs, if you get through the sale, um, you know, you got to go through the eviction process. Even if there's not anybody in there, mm -hmm. um, you got to get, you know, you got to get possession of it legally and correctly. And, uh, you know, there's there's more calls to have to foreclosure sale. So. Yeah, it doesn't mean that the borrower is going to go away just because they got foreclosed on. Or you might, and then you also have gotten into some expensive clean outs. No, absolutely. As well. Absolutely. And that's, you know, that's actually an interesting um, topic. Um, you know, at least in the uh, seconds field, um, you know, early early on I learned even if I get to the sheriff's sale, doesn't mean I'm going to end up with the property. Um, I've worked out a lot of these on the other side of the foreclosure sale mm -hmm. um, during the eviction process. Oh, wow. Like, like you mean you work something out with the borrower once you got to that point or. Yeah, absolutely. So I do, um, you know, from day one, i um, learning this business through some successful investors. Um, I track all my data. Um, so I've worked about eleven, about eleven hundred loans for uh, different investors, mm -hmm. uh, mostly seconds, but definitely first also in there. Um, and uh, you know, on that side, I would probably say at least a hundred of them. Uh, we've come to some type of resolution um, on the other side of the foreclosure sale. If it's you know they're buying the deed back for a fee. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some states you can kind of, um, and it's more non-judicial states that you can resend the sale and actually just move forward with a new agreement. Uh -huh. um, you know, definitely have your attorneys review it, make sure it's compliant and all that. Um, but there's plenty of states where we've had to draft a new uh, mortgage and note and move forward on all new terms. Okay, and I'm guessing do you get like some kind of big good faith down payment from the borrower when you do that? Because I would imagine if they don't follow through, you don't want to have to go back to square one. No, nah, absolutely. And you can definitely put a lot of language in these agreements um, to protect yourself. Um, but yeah, if they're looking to stay in there and have us draft a new mortgage and note, um, they're going to definitely come to the table with a good amount of money. Yeah. How, how often do you have that happen or do most of the sales end up going through? So I'm going to say probably from like 2010 through like 2020 um, is the bulk of my experience um, really doing a lot of the uh, dirty work behind the scenes uh, work for different investors. Mm -hmm. um, and that's what's been pretty cool. Like, you know, managing a thousand notes for about a hundred different investors um, gives you a lot of experience with legal. Um, and what I mean by that, a lot of these funds, you know, if they're pushing 100 notes, um, a lot of funds aren't going to be able to push 100 notes uh, with legal cost. Mm -hmm. Now, if I got 100 notes with 20 different investors, a lot of those investors are prepared with legal cost, and they're going to want to push it. So it gave me a lot of experience. Um, no equity deals, equity deals. Um and yeah, just a lot of different things um, arise um, once you get on the other side of the sale. Um, yeah. You know, obviously right around the sale, a lot of things happen. Um, you know, sometimes when you go through sale, you know, a third party buys it. So you're out of the picture after the sale mm -hmm. um, and getting your payoff um, from a third party at the sale. Wait, mean, what's your strategy for setting your opening bid price when you start? Like I know for me, every deal has been different. Like, are you trying to price set your opening bid so that someone beats you and you don't have to mess with the property or are you trying to end up with the property? 
So there's definitely some exceptions, like um, there's some states like uh, Louisiana that's a little different. Um, Kentucky is. Um, I know Ohio is has changed a little bit. Um, and like I said, a lot of my work was through 2020, so I know things have changed over the last few years. Mm -hmm. But majority of the time when we're taking something to sell from the second position, um, you're bidding subject to the first mortgage. Um, attorneys need to make sure that's clear. Um, first mortgage lenders need to be notified. Um, but when you're bidding with your second, you're basically bidding um, on your second subject to the first. So that number could go anywhere, depending on um, what the investor's in it at, mm -hmm. um, depending on the equity level. You know, if I have a $50,000 second, I mean, I technically can bid anywhere from a dollar up to $50,000 subject to the first. Right. Um, and, you know, as the equity grew in the market, um, we played the game a little differently. Um, but if I had a $50,000 second and, you know, only 30 grand was covered in equity or at least um, a number that we thought we could get at sale, mm -hmm. um, you know, we would we would structure that where we're maybe bidding at 25 k um, subject to the first. And, you know, it all depends on what you're in the note deal at. And uh, like I share with a lot of people, um, you know, with the seconds, and I'm sure it's for you too. Um, it's a lot of times when you get there, you're not only basing it off the deal itself, but you're basing it off of your portfolio um, and what's going to benefit the portfolio and what's good for the portfolio. You know, sometimes it's good to get out just even. Um, mm -hmm. Sometimes you're going to lose a little money, um, but you're going to be smart about it. Um, so the whole portfolio doesn't take a big hit. Yeah, I mean, a lot of times I think, you know, sometimes I think of it in terms of like, what's my time worth? Like I'm sometimes willing to take a small loss if it just gets a problem asset off the plate rather than spend a bunch more time trying to, Recoup a couple extra pennies. Nah, absolutely. I mean, you got to make business decisions every day in this business. Mm -hmm. um, and it really comes down to, you know, your portfolio um, and where you're at with everything. Now, when you foreclose from second, you said you're, you're doing that subject to the first. So does that mean you have to pay off the first or you just have to start making payments on the first? Like you're basically assuming that loan? Absolutely. So. You know, especially like in the uh, client portfolio, I have different levels of investors. Um, I have investors that are involved in everything from first seconds, and they may want the property. Mm -hmm. um, I also have smaller investors um, that might only have a few loans. They really don't want the property. Um, so it, it's kind of what we're talking about. It's all based off of making decisions. Um, where you want to go with this. Um, you know, in some of my smaller clients' portfolios, um, you know, they really don't want the, the property. So maybe we're not, maybe we're going to play, I, I say the game of chicken. Um, mm -hmm. And I don't know if that's the greatest term to use, but, you know, we're always banking on a workout or at least getting some money to get out of the deal. Um mm -hmm. You know, if you're in a second at 15, 20 grand, um, you know, it might not make worth, it might not be worth it to reinstate a first that, you know, the reinstatement's 20 grand. If right. you really don't want to deal with the first and want the property, the first has to be dealt with. Um, the first has a right to then foreclose on us. Mm -hmm. um, and it's what we're talking about. You just got to make a business decision. Um, sometimes with the first and the bigger lenders, um, it, it's tough to deal with them uh, yeah. with, without an authorization. Um, you know, some of them are easier where you can order a payoff and get a payoff. Um, but it depends on my client. Um, it depends on the portfolio that I'm managing. Um, you know, like even in my portfolio, I really don't want the property. Um so I'll make a decision at the end of the day. Sometimes it's a loss. Does the interest rate on the first ever affect your strategy? Like, let's say like you've ever had a scenario where the borrower had say like 3% money on the first and there were maybe some advantages to 
assuming that? Absolutely. And, you know, I'm not suggesting this um, to anybody. Um, you know, you, you always want to check with your attorneys. You always want to be compliant. Uh, you don't want to make a business model out of this. But I've had investors and myself, um, you know, collect rent on the other side and let the first floor close. Mm -hmm. And, you know, get your money out through renting the property, um, you know, being open with the homeowner um, that, you know, there is a first mortgage on the property. Yeah, where my head was going, and, and I've never done a subject to deal, but you could you be potentially more aggressive in bidding a non-performing second to foreclose and you end up assuming a first mortgage with a low interest rate and then do like sell it on seller finance and create a spread? Dude, you is, that, is that too much? Yeah. Nah, you can do it all in this business. Um, like I said, I've got a lot of creative big clients um, that... You know, at least when I'm managing a second and we get there and they end up with the property, I'm kind of out of it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I collect my fee and I'm kind of done. Um, but yeah, everything and anything can happen. Um, like what you're saying. Um, yeah. There's some that will assume it. Um, pay the first mortgage. They have luck with it. Um, and it all depends on if the first really wants to deal with you. But yeah, everything can happen that way. Yeah. So what's your advice for people who are getting started in notes? Like, like some of the stuff we're talking about is a little bit advanced, but like what are some things for people to think about when they're just like trying to get going? Um, you know, always do your due diligence. Um, you know, educate yourself as much as possible. Mm -hmm. um, go to these different conferences, seminars, um, connect with people that are really doing the business. Um, figure out how to add value to people um, one way or another. Um, but I'm a big advocate on, like, if you want to learn something or do something, um, find people that are doing it, figure out how to get involved with them, uh, figure out how to add value and kind of pierce them um, with respect because um, everybody's busy. Everybody's got a lot going on. Um, but I wouldn't be where I'm at today if I didn't learn the business from people, um, you know, create friends, business associates in the business. Um, and eventually you got to jump in and, and buy something. Um, there's nothing better than a uh, real deal experience. Yeah, I found there's a big difference for people between doing zero deals and one. Like that's like a giant step when you do the first one. Absolutely. Um, you know, like I said, you know, Sometimes you lose money. It might be the best experience you've ever got um, that put you in a great position um, to make money. You know, at least with the seconds, depending on what you're buying, because um, there's a lot of levels to the seconds. Um, you know, a perfect second is a property that's a nice property, a lot of equity. The first is current. Um, mm -hmm. All indications are you're going to get a good quality workout. Um, and then there's things that are called unknown first, where um, you can't get a read on if the first is 100% current. Um, you can look at things and determine um, that you think it's current. Uh, sometimes you get better better pricing um, on those deals. Uh -huh. But you're also taking a chance. How, how uh, do you find out? How do you get information on the first? Uh, credit reports. Um, you know, a title report will tell you if there's any active foreclosure. Um, you know, Google, see what you can track down. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, a credit report is a best friend of a note investor um, dealing with seconds. And, and can you get that like on a soft pull or do you have to so have some lot, kind of service set up to do that? Yeah, you definitely got to have a service. Um, you know, if I'm buying a note, I do expect that the note sellers supply a credit report and a title report. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then like, once you buy the note, like, let's say you've got a second, it's reperforming or whatever, and it's performing for you. Do you ever like periodically check up on the first or so? Like how often would you do that? 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, I used to be really, really um, anal about it when I first started, um, you know, checking monthly every other month. Mm -hmm. um, as the portfolio got bigger, I got more comfortable and I also gained more experience. Um, you know, once again, everything and anything can happen in this business, um, but it's a rarity that somebody's paying on my first. I mean, paying on my second and they stop paying on the first. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not saying that that doesn't happen. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, you can put it in your systems, your process, um, randomly check on it. You know, as my portfolio got bigger, um, usually I'll do it like once every six months, uh -huh. uh, once every 12 months, uh, kind of see where the new balance is. Um, That's kind of like what I do with, with um, tax reports. So I'll run tax reports on my whole portfolio every six months. And that yeah. came from an experience a couple of years ago where I had a panic and I thought I might've lost a property that I lost track of. And I didn't like, it was fine. And I'm like, okay, now we're putting the process in place. Like this is not happening. Okay. Absolutely. And like I said, it, it happens where we're getting payments on our second. And the next thing we know, they're not paying on the first. But what happens <laughs> if like, let's say like, like, let's say you were out of the loop and the first forecloses, what, what happens with your second? Um, so, you know, at least in the, you know, a non-performer or a reperforming second, uh, the only two ways to really get wiped out is if a first forecloses on you or if a homeowner files a Chapter 13 bankruptcy, um, they file a motion to strip your lien. Mm -hmm. it's, it's granted by the bankruptcy court, uh, but the homeowner needs to complete that Chapter 13 plan uh, for that strip to happen. So even if a homeowner um, gets the bankruptcy court to grant the strip, mm -hmm. um, and you and you have a right to fight and supply uh, an appraisal um, and prove that there's equity in there, but sometimes if you're playing the game and um, you know now there's so much equity in the market, but you know when we first started with these there wasn't a lot of uh, equity, mm -hmm. so sometimes you made that business decision to just back off. Um, except the fact that the court granted it, but the homeowner ne needs to complete that three to five year bankruptcy plan uh, for the strip to go through. If they don't complete it, you're back in business. Um, if they get dismissed from the bankruptcy, uh -huh. so they are the two. They are the two scenarios where you could get stripped. Now, let's say a first forecloses in a state that has a redemption period. Um, mm -hmm. You as the second mortgage lender, just like the homeowner, um, has the right to reinstate that first. Oh, okay. That's interesting. You know, I actually fell in love with Michigan for that reason. Um, and a lot of this stuff I just discovered working the portfolio for other investors mm -hmm. and just learning everything as time went on. Like, you know, all of a sudden I'm in a redemption period in Michigan and I'm getting a phone call from a realtor that works the redemption period. And he's like, hey, I could sell this property and probably get you some money for your second. Are you up for it? Um, uh -huh. And I can get the first paid off. So a lot of things do happen in that redemption period. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, if a first forecloses um, and there's no redemption period, the sale goes through, um, that second is wiped. How how often do you see seconds getting stripped in those chapter 13 bankruptcies? You were saying like if there's equity, then that's less likely to get. So I'm going to say that happened a lot more from like 2010 to like 2016, 2017. Uh-huh. When uh -huh. borrowers were upside down. You got it. And it was, you know, it's an interesting thing. Like, you know, there's a lot of investors that are not comfortable. Um, and, you know, I could go back and forth. There's seconds that I probably wish I waited on to pursue legal on mm -hmm. that got stripped. Um, but I was just having this conversation with someone yesterday. You know, there's seconds that I had that were pretty big seconds that I got at a very cheap price. Um, the bankruptcy court granted the strip. Mm -hmm. uh, I got booted out to the unsecured creditors. And for a four-year period, I received a nice unsecured payment every month. Uh-huh. 
you know, enough that made the deal whole or even a positive for me. Now, now what happens in this scenario? Let's say the borrower files chapter seven and they say, I'm just giving up and turning the house over. How does that work when you have two lenders in play? Yeah. No, absolutely. It happens, but a lot of times they're just doing it thinking that they could get away from the debt, uh, mm -hmm. not realizing that the debt stays on the property. Yeah. Um, but now, like you said, I mean, if they give it up, you know, you have to make a business decision in the second space a lot. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, maybe you back off it, see what happens. Maybe the first takes it to sale. And there's some surplus for the second. But would the first lien holder take over the property in that scenario? Like if the borrower walks away? Yeah, I haven't seen that happen a lot. Um, uh huh. But, under, you know, it does. But yeah, you know, at, at the end of the day, you'd have to make a decision. Um, you know, if the first takes that property over, I mean, majority of the time, they still got to go through a sale mm -hmm. um, to get possession of it. Right. And, you know, you'll at least get notified and be aware of it. You know, some states, they don't have to notify the other lien holders, but, you know, most states, even junior junior lien holders have to be notified. Gotcha. So what, what, what are some of your pet peeves in the note investing business? Like, what are some of the things that, that annoy you or you're not such a fan of? <laughs> um, people not doing the right thing. Um, educators. Um, investors note funds um as you you know as you know it's a as you get deeper into the niches you know you see a lot of the same faces and a lot of the same people um and i take a lot of pride in having a clean name for over 15 years in this business mm -hmm. um and it's by doing the right thing um and you know everything and anything happens um you know it's all about communication um, not taking things personal, but just doing the right thing. You know, a lot of people are spending money um, on education, um, spending money with funds, uh, spending money on product. And, uh, you know, I don't like to see people uh, taking advantage of other people's money. Yeah, it's certainly something that happens out there. And it's a small industry, but it doesn't always enforce good behavior. No, it doesn't. The way I expected it to. Absolutely. And, you know, like I said, you know, a lot of things happen, um, you know, even if you're managing assets for different investors or it's your own portfolio, um, you know, you just got to communicate. Um, everything doesn't work out perfect on all, all deals. Mm -hmm. um, but if you're doing the right thing, you're communicating um, and you're just doing what you tell people you're doing. Um <laughs> You're not just taking money and buying an asset and doing nothing. Um, yeah. Or, you know, charging people a bunch of money uh, for education and not adding value. And uh, so that's that's probably my my biggest pet peeve. Yeah, I know when I started, I spent quite a bit of money on education and it was missing a lot of important details that I had to learn myself <laughs> the hard way. So. Yeah, and, and, and no doubt. And, you know, you're, you're going to have to spend some money to get educated. Um, just make sure you're doing it with the right people. You know, do your own due diligence. Um, ask people. And like we like we just talked about, you know, you start asking questions to different people in the business. Um, you, you know, you're going to find out quick um, mm -hmm. who's not doing the right thing and uh, who to who to kind of stay away from. Yeah, especially if you go to live events. Like I was just, you know, I was at DME a couple months ago. And it's Absolutely. funny how like, you know, if you hang out like later at night at the bar, like you hear all the stuff that's going Absolutely. on. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Cool. Well, Bill, thanks so much for joining. It's a good spot. Really, really appreciate you coming on. Yeah, man. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, over the last few years, I've kind of got away a little bit from doing podcasts and getting out there. So just trying to get back out there. Um, people see my face, kind of know what I'm up to um, and just learn a little bit about what I'm up to and uh, try to add value back to the marketplace. Uh, it's one of my biggest things is uh, adding value to people. No, very cool. How can people get a hold of you? Um, I'm on all social media platforms, um, Facebook, um, 
Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn. Uh, I can supply my phone number and my email address. Um, my phone number is 484-356-4128. Again, 484-356-4128. Uh, my email address is mortgage pay help. So mortgage pay p a y help h e l p at gmail dot com. Um, email is probably the best bet. Uh, send me a message on um, any different social media platform. You know, just look for Bill McCafferty, the bald head, yeah. the smile and face. Um, yeah, sounds good. I'll put a link to your email and stuff in the notes for this so it's easy for people to find. Awesome. Cool. Well, thanks again, Bill. Really appreciate it. Dan, I appreciate it. I think it's great what you're up to and uh, keep at it. All right. Sounds good.